Um, and most of those are then going to produce electronic versions of the articles so that you can see them right away. Uh, and then we also went through and made a list of useful databases, uh, some of which you may be familiar with, some you may not. JSTOR and Project Muse are two databases that a lot of times people don't have access to. Can anyone tell me what an academic or scholarly journal is? Julie. It's a peer-reviewed journal that someone can work whatever is the figure. Yeah, so in order to get published, uh, by the way, you can jot anything I say down. I, I don't know if I need to, okay. Peer-reviewed journal. Um, so a peer-reviewed journal is one where in order to get published, your draft has to be reviewed by a panel of experts. So like if I wanted to get something published, I send it into the peer-reviewed journal, they send it out to some anonymous reviewers, they look at it, those anonymous reviewers send it back to me, with like, you know, some suggestions, they verify the truthiness of my claims, uh, whether it's up to date, all of that kind of stuff. Now, why do you think that might be good for a debate? Yeah. Yeah, you know, for sure it's true. Or even if it's not true, it's at least been verified. What else do you know about the quality of the argument, probably? Mm -hmm. That it's within the yeah, so it's pretty up to date in order to get published there. What else is probably true about the people that are writing in the journals or other stuff you wanted to say, Kelly? Uh, yeah, I mean, now, to the degree that people can set aside their biases or their perspectives or whatever, that's definitely true. But it is also the case that those individuals probably have some in depth knowledge about a particular subject area. Now, how do you think that's different from, say, a magazine like Time or The Economist? Yeah, no, I mean, if you're a reporter for Time Magazine and you've been in, uh, you know, Afghanistan for the last, uh, you know, 10 years studying and, and reporting on Afghanistan and whatnot, like, you're clearly an expert. But the amount of review that's being given to your work is really just going to be your editor. And so that helps to ensure um, that, you, you know, it may be high quality work, but it also is uh, not necessarily reviewed by the same amount of people. All that makes sense to everybody? So I'm saying all that to you because it's super important that you be aware of where the sources are that you're getting stuff. Anybody know what a think tank is? Yeah. Like the Heritage Foundation or the Building Institute. Like, there's organizations of what I would consider to be very biased people to like come up with conclusions that they want, like they want to see. Yeah, I think that's really interesting because uh, perspective I guess I would say is not necessarily the same thing as bias. Uh, Cato Institute is a libertarian think tank. Anybody know what a libertarian thinks or what the Cato Institute thinks, well, broadly speaking? Yeah. Yeah, like get government out. Government equal bad. That's the Cato Institute's perspective on stuff. Okay. So if I am in a, doing research on trying to like find some evidence that says that. Uh, the U.S. government should help to fund uh, economic assistance programs in Venezuela uh, in order to help to expand the scope of government. Cato going to give me much? Nope. No. Now, I know that. Cato is very upfront about it. So in the sense that we are usually skeptical of bias, I think one of the things to remember about think tanks is that they're coming at it with a perspective, but you know up front what that perspective is. And so you should keep that in mind, certainly. And it may be a reason why you don't frequent particular think tanks. But it's also the case that if you wanted to do some research about private investment counter plan going to Cato, they're going to get you some good solvency cards. Because think tanks are basically groups of scholars or policymakers that study problems and make policy recommendations. What does that sound like? Debate? Yeah, does that sound like debate to you a little bit? Like people sitting around talking about policy problems and making some recommendations? All right, fine. Um, questions about any of that? OK, uh, then let us uh, speak uh, more systematically of verbatim. It's going to take me a second to switch over.
say something to you um, as well like some of you um, believe you can multitask uh, and you cannot your brain does not work that way um, and so stay focused and like I said even if you are somebody that um, feels like you know quite a lot about verbatim you definitely or hopefully uh, will learn a little bit uh, as well so um, I was gonna show you on the PC side because the first thing in your notes that you might want to jot down about verbatim is that the PC version of verbatim has a few more bells and whistles than the Mac side. Raise your hand if you have a Mac. Okay. You know how everyone's always like, oh, Macs are so awesome. Well, they are, I suppose, but on this verbatim business, a little less awesome. Um, of those of you that have Macs, how many of you have Boot Camp or Parallels or something like that? Okay. Because you can install um, the PC version. Uh, don't ever try to project it if you do that, but you can install it and then that gets you access to the bells and whistles. So I'm gonna show you, because it's the only one that will show up, uh, the Mac version of it, but I will highlight a couple of things that will appear on the PC side that do not appear uh, on the Mac side of verbatim. Uh, the second kind of broad overview comment that I wanna make is that Verbatim allows for interoperability of files. What do I mean by that word, interoperability? We'll just speculate it means given the context. Try. Uh, it's cross. Uh, no. It can go between the two different types of systems. Yeah, exactly. So verbatim allows us both to be able to work between PC and Macs uh, in a very compatible way. And it also allows us to work with um, similar files. So, you know, at Northwestern or Michigan State or Georgetown, they're all using verbatim as well. How many of you are familiar with the open evidence project that the NDCA does? Okay, so pretty much all of the workshops are using verbatim so that it is easier for you when come the end of the summer, you go to the open evidence project and look for sites and things like that, then uh, verbatim is gonna allow you to be able to operate a little bit more seamlessly. 
Uh, big item the next about verbatim is that um, the you should think of some of the features like an expando. Who can tell me what an expando is? Oh. Expando <laughs> is like a folder like an accordion. Yeah. Many things, like many things. Yeah, exactly. Many, 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 things. many things. Yes. Um, and so that uh, is um, uh, how you should think or lo the logic of verbatim. Uh -huh. uh, my question is, do you want us to actually get this program, or do you want to just explain how it works? Or something? I have a couple of responses to your question. Uh, the first is that, um, yes, I'm going to walk through some stuff, and yes, you are going to download it, but don't do it right now because then you will be so distracted by trying to download it that you are unable to kind of follow. Raise your hand if you have used verbatim before. Okay, so that's not a ton of you. Um, maybe it looks like about a third to a half of you. Um, the rest of you should definitely be paying attention, but even those of you that have used it before, like I said, I'm gonna show you hopefully some ways to make uh, yourself a little bit more efficient. When we are done here, I'm gonna set aside some time where a handful of staff have agreed to help you to make sure to download it. It's pretty easy, you probably could figure it out for yourself, but if you don't have verbatim on your computer, uh, you need to get it and you need to have it on your computer before 1.30. And there are a couple of you that I'm aware of some issues you're having, we'll talk about that at the end, so. All right, other questions so far? Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is to walk you through some of the parts. Um, I'm not going to walk you through how to install it um, because that a bunch of you already have it. Um, the first thing that I want to do is to show you. Sorry, my screen was a little. So you can kind of see this a little bit. So this squared off is called a pocket. Uh, one of the things you'll notice on the, le on the um, side of the document uh, is something called a navigation pane. One of the benefits of using verbatim is that it allows you to move within the navigation pane. Some of these things I'm just going to mention to you and then other people are going to talk with you about it in more detail. Um, but the benefit of these big headers like the pocket is you can see that it shows up in a different space than what comes under it, which is a block title. And so I wanted to show you one of the most effective ways to create your kind of initial document for cutting cards into is to create what I call a master document. Uh, and this is where you kind of brainstorm what it is that you are going to try to cut cards for and then type those, turn them into block headings, and that allows you to then pretty easily as you're reading articles, copy and paste into the document in the proper sort, the place where you would like for it to go. So here you can see that I've typed a bunch of uh, solvency mechanisms and once you have you can do this in a, a couple of different ways, but what I like to do is to type up those parts and then decide how I'm going to um, format them. Because you can do it all at one time. You can see if I just highlight that, and then I go up here, and I click F6, uh, I can either cl click it on the bar, or I can click F6, and it turns all of that text into block titles. So whereas before they did not appear in the navigation pane, they do now. Did y'all see that? Okay. So this is helpful to you in the midst of a debate, and in a little bit, uh, Shelby's going to show you kind of how to utilize um, this all for the purpose of creating a speech document. Um, but for the purpose of actually writing blocks, you can easily see that there are uh, different block titles. So if you were cutting a card and you knew this was really about access to telecommunications, or the internet, then you can uh, click on it on the navigation pane and it will take you to that block. The other benefit of this is that over here in the navigation pane, you can move stuff around. So let's say that you just added some additional cards. You were down in here and you realized you wanted to write about um, solvency and you knew that wasn't in the right section. You can go over here on the navigation pane and move it 
Well, you can, I promise. You can move it um, in to another section. I don't know how that's set up right. Um, so anyway, the benefit of the navigation pane then is it allows you to move in between stuff. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So block titles then, um, what's the purpose of a block title? You can see it better. Yeah. What's the purpose of just like a block title? What's a block title? Like if you had a like old school piece of paper and it had a block title on it, why would you have that block title? Thomas, Thomas, wake up, wake up. Sorry. If you had a, somebody from this side of the room, if you had a block title, what is that? Why do you, why do we put titles on blocks? Try. So you know what it says? What, what says? What the block, what the evidence is on the block says. Yeah, so a block title is just allow, is an organizational thing, right? It allows you to know what evidence is going to be on that particular piece of paper. And so in paperless debating then, you don't have to have the same sort of repeat of all of those titles, but on this, you can see each section and know that on that particular part of the document, that all of those cards under it are gonna be uh, cards that remove oil restrictions to help to solve the economy. Okay, so that's a block title. That is F6. In the paperless guide, there is also um, a listing, a cheat sheet of the shortcuts. I already pointed out pocket, that's what this is. And then the other option that kind of helps you to organize sections of a document is called a hat. Um, here is an example of a hat. So you can see it kind of goes pocket, hat, block title in terms of the indentations on the navigation pane. That allows you to more easily see the sections. Here is something that even if you've used verbatim before, you may not know. Raise your hand if you have a PC and you've used verbatim before. Can anyone tell me what a navigation pane toggle is? Okay. Um, I can't hear you. It's like so you can turn it on your own so that you can have this view. No? No? Okay, so this feature, here's something, even if you've used verbatim, you might not know. On the PC side, you can cycle through the navigation, you can tell the navigation pane to cycle through the headings so that it, you, do you see how it would be hard maybe to see everything that is under there and be able to digest all that information when really you're looking to try to figure out what advantage cards there are, but you'd have to look at all of the solvency stuff. One manual way to fix that is you just click on this and it closes that up. In the PC version, you can have this navigation pane cycle that will cycle through and show you all of the elements and then go back. So it expands it and then collapses it with one click. Does that make sense to you? It's okay if it doesn't. Use your words. Yes. Okay, well for the couple of notes that I heard, basically what I'm saying is if you were trying to look at a document and you were trying to figure out go-to parts of that document, you can by hand expand and contract, expand and contract, expand and contract. Got it? There is also a feature on the PC version of Verbatim that allows you to, in one click, expand and contract everything so that it is easier for you to see the different sections that are available in your document. Okay, um, the uh, next thing that I wanted to say to you is that for blocking purposes, you must, this maybe if you've tuned me out, tune me back in on this, because this is something that needs to be true across the entire workshop, your block titles must be formatted using F6. Block titles must be formatted using F6. That's true in Mac and in PC. Your tags need to be titled, or need to be formatted using F7, which is the tag. So let's say that I was cutting some cards um, about US economic engagement is key to US-Venezuela relations. And I found a card that said uh, removal, well, oil investment key to Okay, so I type that and then I click on either up here on the ribbon or using F7 as a shortcut. I click on the tag. Did y'all see what happened on the navigation pane? 
Okay, are you starting to see sort of how this all fits together to make it a lot easier? Okay, so when you are tagging a card, who can tell me what a tag is? Yeah? It's, it's basically a summary of what, of the point you're trying to get across by the mm -hmm. It's If you're thinking about arguments as a claim, a proof, and warrant, then the tag is the claim that you are about to make with your piece of evidence. And so you can sometimes, let's say I had a bunch of cards about the, you know, this particular advantage, and I wanted to get to a particular card, I can now see it by the tag, but the tag also is gonna be helpful to me uh, to be able to distinguish between the pieces of evidence that I'm actually gonna get. So your tags all need to be formatted F7. How many of you have ever written a block before in your life? ever. Okay. Uh, how many of I'm um, raise your hand again. Ever written a block before in your life? Okay. Um, interesting. Uh, so some of you that had your hands up, how many of you have used like control V? I will bold my tag. Control V. I will paste. All that stuff. Okay. So all of these shortcuts are going to help you to be a lot more efficient and hopefully produce a lot more work. So your tags need to be F7s, your block titles need to be F6. Your lab instructors will probably have a preference about pockets and hats um, as organizational schemes, so you should talk to them about it. You may even want to jot a note to yourself uh, that you should ask about what their preference is about um, hats and pockets. Um, I'm just going to share a little bit about myself with you right now. I think hats are ugly. I don't know why. It just like, look, not like hats you put on your head, but I, I just think that is like ugly to me. I don't really know why. I have no logic, but I, I don't enjoy the hats. And so my preference is no hats. That does not have to be your preference. And that's one of the great things about verbatim is that you get to like tailor it to kind of yourself and what it is that you would like to do. So, um, okay, so that's that. Um, the next thing that I wanted to talk to you about is a couple of other things that may be useful to you in the formatting of cards. So let's see if I can. Okay, so here's a real life file, and I want to show you. <coughs> Thank you. Well, let me do it like this. Okay, so let's say that I wanted to copy and paste a card. Um, I would do so by finding an article. And I would copy it, just like you normally would. Then I would right click it and click copy. Then I'd go back to my Word document. And let's say that it was a card that went in here. I would type my tag. Um, I would, what do I need to put that in? Absolutely. Put that in properly. Then I would go up here. Do you see this F2 paste text? Now, one option is definitely for me to hit Control V, uh, and that would paste it, absolutely. The benefit of using this F2 function is that it strips the formatting from the thing that you are about to copy. How many of you have ever copied and pasted something where it just like looked all wonky when you put it into the Word document? So this should take care of most of that. So there I've pasted the text. Now let's say uh, that I wanted to get rid of these paragraphs and wanted it to look more like just a card. That's where F3 comes in. If you click F3, it will square everything and take away the paragraphs. People have different preferences about this. Some people prefer you to leave it in paragraph form. Some people want you to take the paragraphs out. Do you see these little things right here? Do you see where the cursor is? See? Okay. That's called a pill crow. I did not know that before verbatim. You can actually, in this formatting business, uh, shrink the pill crows so that it looks a little bit smaller, um, so that they don't show up as much, but that gives you some sense of that. Okay. So then let's say that I wanted to underline part of this because I was going to read it in a debate. Uh, there is an underline function. I could select that. I haven't found that to be any easier for myself than hitting control U, um, but you may find that clicking the F9 is just as easy. 
So once you've done that, uh, you can then go through, let's say that's all of the card you were gonna read. If you um, go up under formatting, there is this function called shrinking text. This makes it a little bit easier to read on your computer because it will go through and shrink into eight point font everything that is not underlined. Yeah. In terms of efficiency stuff, like I know some of you are like, I, I don't know what you're saying, but for efficiency's purposes, some of these shortcuts add up over time and add up as you are writing blocks. Oh, uh, so I underlined it and then it's up under formatting and it's shrink text. All right, while I'm here in the formatting button, I also want to show you a couple of other things that may be helpful to you. Uh, if you're in a site and want to remove hyperlinks, you can just click on that. Um, whatever you're thinking, can you just like highlight the whole card? And yes, uh -huh. yeah, you do not, yeah. That, so the reason why that is awesome is if you've ever gone through by hand and tried to shrink text, you got to highlight what you want to shrink, go up, pick the eight point font, drag it down, then it's done. All you do here is highlight the whole card, click shrink text, and it knows, because it's like alive or smart or something, it knows what is not underlined and it shrinks that. I don't think it's actually alive, but I'm just saying. Yeah. Is there a way to change the settings on the computer to make it smaller than the it, it, yes, is the answer, but I would encourage you to leave it at eight point font. I think that it is a general norm, although there's some debate about it. There is a general norm that eight point is the smallest that you should go. Why do you think that is? I mean, there are definitely schools that have reputations for being huge violators of this. We will not name them. Don't do it. Uh, but what's the, why would you want to only leave it at that? Yeah. So you can still read it. Yeah, who's the they? The other team. Yeah, right. Because some of you, not any of you, of course, might be shady uh, and might have some stuff under there like not, uh, and you're claiming the other way, and so, you know, people got to be able to check you out. Plus, uh, and I actually didn't think about this until a few years ago, we had a debater who uh, had actual, like, eye problems, and anything smaller than eight-point font, he, actually, he just, like, literally could not read, like, he could not see it. Uh, and so you also should be aware that there are people who, by virtue of their physicalness, uh, need to have the font that way too. Other questions? Uh -huh. um, yes, I believe, I'd have to think about what the thing is. Yes, Sarah? What if the other team makes their font three points? What do I do? That is a good question. Anybody have any suggestions? What do you think Sarah should do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can do it that way. Mm -hmm. You do control or command eight to bring it back to eight. Mm -hmm. Yep, those are a couple of options. Yeah. Um, if you have your verbatim set up correctly, when they flash their stuff to you, it will automatically change it to your settings. So yep. whatever you have, it just oh. bring it into your settings. Mm -hmm. So even if they made it two bits or whatever, it will still bring it up for mm -hmm. you. Yep. Other suggestions that whatever you do to change the font, change it so you can read it. Right? It's their computer. Don't care. know where it is maybe somebody else does in the math version there is a thing that's called verbatim settings and in that verbatim settings if you click on it it will pop up a box that allows you to change the font size that is the default font size uh, if you would like to do it it also shows you a few other things so in lab uh, perhaps uh, on a PC people can show you that just to clarify verbatim is an add-on word right yeah okay. it uses yes essentially yeah. Okay, so um, I saw the highlight button up there for F11. Is does it do the same thing as underline and it will shrink the other text or? Uh, can you no. Still uh, well, no, but it does highlight it. So okay, if I go so here, you have to mm -hmm. so if I go here, well, you could underline it or not to highlight it. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you highlight it, it just does the whole thing all at once. Oh, so okay. it's a one click as opposed to me going here, then having to go over here. Yeah, so. Okay. Thank you. All right. Other questions. Thank you.
Okay. So I, I want to be real clear about what my goal was, and, and usually you're clear about your goals before you start something as opposed to after. My goal was not to show you everything in verbatim, because that would be impossible. It also takes away all the fun of you getting to discover stuff. And you can tell even from just the question of how do you increase font size, that there are multiple ways to do it. But this should give you a sense of being a little bit more uh, comfortable with it uh, as you are making use of it for blocking purposes. Yeah. Oh, there, but there is no add-on for Excel, which is supposed to help with your flowing. Or... Um, okay, this is an important moment. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. I know that some of you have big, giant serial killer handwriting. Do you know <laughs> what I'm talking about? Big, giant serial killer handwriting? I know that some of you have it. I don't know if you do or not. Uh, and so flowing on paper is like hard for you. I would almost say that 100% regardless you should be flowing on paper if you are paperless because if your computer crashes, there's some issue, it falls off the podium and busts into a thousand pieces, you would at least still have your flow. Plus it is easier, there are some people who are effective at shifting between um, flowing on the computer and being paperless on the computer, but I think a lot of people would argue that flowing on paper equal good. The answer to your question is no, there's no verbatim based flowing software. Yes, ma'am. Well, if you download Verbatim, can you also, like, would it be a good idea to download the base Synergy Timer? Because Verbatim has no timer. Uh, on the PC version, it does, actually. Did you hear me? Did you hear me? Did you hear me? Yeah. On the PC version, Verbatim does have a timer. And it's always on the top. Um, they're also doing some upgrades this summer um, that is going to connect up the um, verbatimness of your computer to the wiki that I mentioned earlier, the NDCA wiki, and that's going to be super helpful because you'll just be able to export uh, your sites out to that to the wiki um, just automatically. So there are some upgrades that are uh, coming. Okay. Um, other questions? Okay. Uh, raise your hand, and I'm only doing this for efficiency's sake. Raise your hand if you do not have Word on your computer. Raise them high. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to into the CQ. Okay, you need to see me. Uh, where's my Tiffany? Are you the one with the on the Word, but not on the Mac? Okay, got it. Okay, we should also talk. All right. Uh, the couple of people who I'm giving computers to, you should also see me um, so that we can work with you as well. Yes? What version of Word do you have to have? Um, I believe the answer on, P do you have a PC or a Mac? PC. Uh, I think any version. Uh, sorry, I meant any recent version. So, 07 forward. Yeah. No, I, I have uh, 2013 and it still works. Awesome. Yeah. No, it has to be worked. Shh. I, I, I have that, um, and it works. I mean, apparently not when I'm trying to project it, but normally it works. Um, and it shows me all the like PC options and works works fine. Um, I will say that I think and Shelby and I were talking about this the other day. I think that um, if you're just block writing, um, the PC version features are more about uh, actually using it in a debate. Um, so I do cut cards and write blocks just on the Mac side with that version of verbatim on my Mac side. Sure. Mm -hmm. As a for my big work. There are a couple functions you cannot do on the Mac side. For instance, you cannot, in a, in a navigation panel, on a Mac, you can't drag and drop things. You can on a PC, which I can tell from my, I don't want to move things around. You also can't do a lot of the macros. They don't work as well on the Mac side. They just aren't supported and they'll break really fast. And they also create massive formatting problems for people on PCs. I think everybody should probably do way work on PC until we are gone with Microsoft. Yeah. But yeah, it's 
much easier if you can boot camp or run it on a PC. You're going to be much happier. I'm going to talk to Sarah later over lunch about what macros she's experienced breaking. Because I do think that that um, highlights the benefit of everybody talking about this. And one of the great things about new and experienced users of Verbatim is that you can have a dialogue where people have encountered different things and what their fixes was and stuff. So I think that's real good. And hopefully y'all will share in lab a lot of different things and go back and talk about it um, in the dorm and stuff. Okay, so Shelby is going to show you how you would make use of some of this in an actual uh, debate to paperlessly debate after I answer this question. Oh, well, I just wanted to add something. I'm looking at uh, the, uh, the file that's telling you how to install it. Uh -huh. And on whatever version of Windows that they have, it's actually different from any earlier version. So, the, uh, so I just want to share with you that either Gateway, which we, um, we don't have Gateway anymore, but straight to users, or if you click Run, you have to click we got you. Yeah, we got you. I appreciate that. We are going to, after <coughs> this is done, have some of us that have some experience installing it and stuff with uh, people who have problem computers and whatnot or don't know they have problem computers. We're going to help you. So do not try to install yourself right now. <laughs> Instead, watch Shelby. Go, Shelby. Go. All right. So a lot of the functions that Tracy discussed were about how you would use verbatim when you're cutting cards, et cetera. Um, for those of you that raise your hand and say that they use verbatim, maybe you use verbatim, but there's functions you probably don't use. For example, half of you at debate team upon serving before this little demonstration still use control C and control V. I don't know, do any of you use control C, control V? Raise your hand if you're victims or suspects. All right, so there's a little toggle button on your computer that you can use when you have a speech document. So this is what PC verbatim looks like. You can ignore the like what that is because I'll spare you, but up here in the corner where the mouse is, the green arrow is how you create a speech document. You want to create that off the file for uh, being able to move cards to a document for your speech. So if you, your next speech is the 2AC and you have to give that speech, you push the button and it creates the speech doc. You have to save it, which is useful because when your computer crashes later, you'll still have it. So I'm just going to put 2AC, whatever. Okay. So now that you have a speech document op open, you can automatically have cards put into that speech document without control C or control D. And the squiggle button, or as I recently learned, the tilde, that's right, right, Sarah? <laughs> tilde, <laughs> tilde, tilde, tilde. So the squiggle button, like I said, uh, will help you transfer those cards over. So say I have uh, an F, someone says a counter plan, uh, and I want to have offense on conditionality that's apparently carded. Uh, I'm going to use this little squiggle button pushed it. You can't really see that, but I promise I did. See how it pops up over here on the speech document? And you can do that with anything you want to like answer. So, <laughs> alright, so I want to transfer this answer to backs are important with the tilde, and it shows up right underneath. So you can go through every argument in the 1NC, and hopefully you have a block to that because you've done lots of research and prepping because you learned how to block a camp, and you can just move it over during prep time without wasting time control seeing and highlighting and control being and have it in the speech doc, which is conveniently saving as you work so you don't lose your speech. Once you have it, um, you want to make sure you save it on a jump drive so that you could give it to the other computer or to the other team or on your viewing computer so that they can have it to the other team. Um, I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about prep time here. So prep time uh, is still kind of contentious with paperless debate. You want to make sure you know kind of the preferences of the school and the judge, judge is important on prep time. There are two philosophies that are generally used that I kind of have come to know. Maybe you have a third I've not heard of. But the first is that the prep time stops when the jump drive is out of your computer. So that would mean that you had to save it on the jump drive and take it out of your computer. The other is that once you're saving the document, you can stop. That's the less preferred one because a lot of times saving can lead to clicking and new arguments and new ideas, which is stealing prep time, which will be discussed at a later date. Uh, but that will be how you determine when you would stop your prep time. So I have two arguments here. Say there was another thing in the one in C, but it's on my flow. I might write C flow, so I don't forget, drop it, and get yelled at. But that way you have a note for yourself for when you're giving your speech, you can do that. A lot of people don't include things like theory answers or impact extensions for their two AC docs, but they do it anyways. 
sometimes you might put C flow. If there's like defense someone had in the one in C on case that you just wrote down on your flow, you can look at it, and that'll remind you to look at it. Another thing that's useful for speech times, well, you actually have to get the speech, right? So you could do it like this and scroll and scroll and be like, I'm still scrolling with the timer. I'm so fast, you can't keep up with the scrolling because I'm so awesome because I do speaking drills every day. So that's probably not true. But anyways, you can click this little handy dandy button down here. This one. Full screen reading. And instead of taking your mouse up there on the podium that's made out of cardboard and going to fall down at any minute, you could just take your computer and hope to God it doesn't fall or whoever. <laughs> Uh, and <laughs> use your keyboard and just push the down arrow, arrow and go through like that instead of scrolling. And it's a lot faster. And it tells you how many pages are left. So you're like looking at the timer and you're like, oh, I have a minute and there's like 12 pages left. Maybe I can skip this 18th to sad defense card. <laughs> you probably should at that point. Oh, wait. Just, oh, you know what you do then? What do you do? What do you do, Sarah? You have. One minute left. What do you do? What button do you Oh, oh yeah. What would you do if you had a minute left and you were in the middle of a really long car? Who knows? Skip to the important stuff? Yeah, just skip right through. Make sure that no one knows. You just read random parts. <laughs> That's her sarcastic voice. And then tell voice. them you read all of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was my her sarcastic voice. Who else? Right. Right. How do you do that? How do you remember where you stop? <laughs> this is important, y'all. You should focus. Right, so the timer beeps and I ended disasters and there's a bunch more going on. What can I do? Oh, you have to be in read mode. You have to be in read mode. There we go. Uh, click on disasters or whatever. There. Uh, what, 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 what's the new belt button? This is new button, y'all. Okay. There we go. Ooh, it starts Ooh. the time. And that's useful because you can do it in the middle of the speech and at the end of the speech, right? So like if you're if you didn't highlight a card before the mouse because you just cut it because you're doing research and you wanted updates immediately, you can mark it and keep going. And you can also like say I want to skip this paragraph because I know it's just details so down here is the real one. You can mark it again and start reading again. And that's that little squiggle button that we use to move it over again. Questions about any of that? There's a lot of murmuring. I don't know if that's because you're like super excited about the fact you now don't have to cheat. I don't have to push control on mine. If you have a Mac, the Mac shortcut buttons at the top, the F1, F2, F3 are multi-functioned. So unless you override the system that tells you brightness is F1 and F2, you have to use control and F1 or F and F1. But on a PC, you just use F1 and F2. The squiggly button does both card for Amazon. Yeah, it just depends on what mode the document's in. So if you're in like I can type mode and I'm cutting cards and I have a speech document open, you can push the tilde to transfer a card to a speech document. But if you're in full squeak screen reading mode, you push the tilde and it marks the card. Okay. Any other questions? Concerns. Okay, one thing um, Tracy Tracy didn't say that's useful for a bit round because I was into it. But the, there's a button called warrants. Anybody know what a warrant is? <laughs> Most important thing, in it, right? Okay. So this card, so good. Actually, probably not. Good, but whatever. So it's so good, you want to type out some warrants. You can leave notes for yourself. It creates a comment box, and that can be like, the warrant is so good. But you'd actually put what the warrant is, so that come rebuttal time, you have some extensions happening that you can refer to to help you with prep management. And that would be done like prior to the debate. You, know, you don't want to like be wasting prep time. Well, it's not really wasting prep time. You would want to be using time efficiently. So hopefully you've done that work prior. If not, you'd want to read the cards and the debate round, make sure they say what they're supposed to say and all that. All right, other questions? Okay. Is there like an upgraded version of it? Like do you have to like buy an upgraded version? Now, oh, the other crucial thing, I probably didn't actually say this out loud because it's just so integrated into my being. Verbatim is free, um, and so you don't have to pay for anything other than making sure that you have Word. 
Uh, there is an upgrade that's occurring at the end of the summer that's going to fix a couple of grip glitches. Um, Aaron Hardy also told me that some of it is going to hopefully make it better on the Mac side of things too. Um, so for those of you that just have the Mac side, you know, it's, it's all, it's fine. Um, and so you want to check back. Um, the website is Paperless Debate, and that's all in that paperless guide. So you can check back periodically, and that's an easy like thing to upgrade. So okay. Um, okay. Um, any other questions? Okay, I need you to not move. Don't move. Don't move. Don't move. Okay, I need you to contemplate yourself, and you need to put yourself into one of the following categories. Are you ready? Okay, you got to listen to all the categories before you place yourself. Category one, I have verbatim installed properly on my computer. I am good to go with verbatim. That's category one. Category two, I have a PC that has Word on it but does not have verbatim. I have a Mac, that, that was category three, I have a Mac that has Word on it, but does not have verbatim installed on it. I do not fit into one of those three categories. That's the fourth category. OK. Yeah, you should talk. OK, so um, uh, Sarah and Josh ha have nicely volunteered to help people who need to uh, install verbatim. Uh, Brian Gaston will also help, uh, and he is particularly adept at installing it on Macs. Okay? So, and somebody else told me they would help me too. And Colin, uh, and you're mostly PC, right? Okay. So, uh, Colin uh, Quinn is going to assist if you have a PC. So they are going to spread themselves throughout the room, and you will go to one of the four of them. If you fit into the category of, I have that word on my PC, you're going to go see Colin or Sarah or Josh. Uh, if you have it on Word, um, on a Mac, then you're going to go see Brian. Any of the people who can't fit themselves into a category, you should come and see me. Okay, and then everybody else can go to lunch. Where do you need to be? Oh, wait.